so uh, a little bit of correction there. I, I won't be doing an ICO pitch, but I will be talking about um, something that's kind of top of mind right now, and I like the fact that a lot of people much smarter than I went up before me to talk about the nuances of the securities regulatory industry and what we're seeing in the future and what we're hoping to build over the next, hopefully, not longer than 12 months. Uh, my name is Sang Lee, as mentioned before. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Dark Matter. Um, but before I go get into it and talk about what we've been doing at Dark Matter, uh, I want to talk about the asset management industry as a whole. And really, I'm so pleased to be here with so many like-minded folks. Um, as you've seen during the crypto winter, there's a lot of events and conferences, and there's been a lot of a fallout, right? And the fact that you're still here means that you're still keen on building something. So I'm excited to speak to you as well as with you after the talk if there's something that we can collaborate on or partner on. Um, so one of the common topics of today has been the financial crisis, how things came out of the financial crisis and what things needed to be done to fix it. But I wanted to quantify it for folks here to really understand what actually happened that day or that month um, after Lehman collapsed. So 54% of global wealth estimated was wiped out almost instantaneously. Um, and that number is something that has somewhat recovered, but if you think about the centralization risk that we were, we've been talking about all day, that's effectively what caused it. And it wasn't the regulators or the failure of the regulators um, in creating the right regulations to protect us, it was the fact that there was a single point of failure within the asset management financial services industry that we could not recover from. And I won't get into the specifics of it, but everybody knows what happened with Lehman and AIG. There was a single point of failure um, that caused the entire system to collapse. As a, as a repercussion of the financial crisis, we lost 8.8 .8 million jobs, and the perturbations after that are estimated to be closer to 20 million jobs. So what can we do as an industry to prevent this from happening ever again? We've talked about blockchain or cryptocurrency as a means of a store of value. We've talked about it as a payment mechanism. We've talked about immutable records and decentralization. But at the end of the day, there's a gorilla in the room that hasn't been addressed in a large scale. And that's the asset management industry looking from the top down. We talk about STOs, we're talking about ICOs, and, and things that have come up over the last six to 12 months but nobody has actually knocked down the doors of these large financial institutions that were bailed out, that do still exist today, and talk about how we can transfer that infrastructure over to the blockchain. And that's what we've been working on at Dark Matter. So the global asset management industry, I was really surprised at this number because we corrected it this week. It used to be $71.4 trillion as of 2017. It's grown to $94 trillion, with investor wealth estimated in the next year or two to grow to $224 trillion. Up until 2008, and for many years after that, the US, and continues to be, the dominant capital markets in the world. We have the most sophisticated investor base, we have the most depth in capital, and that capital's been deployed across different asset classes, and we have the most choice and menu of the different kinds of assets that we can invest in, including cryptocurrency right now. But in actuality, the investor wealth that you're seeing here today, $224 trillion. And I want to put this in scale because I was just looking at the market capitalization of all cryptocurrency. It's about 122 billion today. So it's not even a percentage as of yet compared to the actual investor wealth that exists and will continue to grow into the future. So if you actually look at the delta adjusted by a few factors, we're looking in excess of $150 trillion that needs to flow into the asset management industry in one shape or another. And it's really up to us here today to figure out if that's gonna happen through blockchain, through cryptocurrency, or if it's gonna make the same mistakes over and over again and still encumber everybody to be subjected to the same types of assets that are constantly pitched to us by larger financial institutions. So the global asset management industry, while what I just shared was kind of a macro level, if you look at it on a global segmented basis, you'll see that a lot of the growth that's gonna happen over the next couple of years will not come, from a percentage standpoint, will not come from the North American market. 
The North American market will continue to grow because it is the gorilla in the room, and on a percentage basis, even a little bit really affects the global asset management market. But if you actually look at Latin America and APAC, that's where most of the shift is going to happen. However, when we look at these markets, their infrastructure for financial services or asset management is much less sophisticated than in the United States. So what that means over the last two decades is that they've been subject to this kind of very limited subset of assets. They've been limited to domestic investments. And that's been further encumbered by the fact that financial regulations, paperwork, lack of transparency has kept them out of the playing pool. But if we're looking five, 10 years down the road, they're going to continue to command a massive presence in asset management, but how do we really facilitate that without making the same mistakes that caused the financial crisis in 2008? So what we've been doing at Dark Matter is solving the major problems that we've seen while working in the industry, but also by analyzing what actually happened in the financial crisis. Lack of transparency is something that we constantly talk about, but if you, even if you've done a private investment or maybe you've invested in an ICO, there's a massive lack of transparency that's caused by the amount of layers of paperwork or the reporting that a company or an individual has to do in order to fully understand the financial ramifications or the risks of that investment in and of itself. That's further exacerbated by complex global regulations. So when we first started the company, we had assisted in creation of the Jobs Act. So we talked about Jeff before it talked about 1933. 1933, the first time the US defaulted on its debt. It was also the time the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Act of 1934 and the subsequent year were created. They've remained largely the same but more and more band-aids have been put on to attempt investor protection, but in actuality, they've created a giant disservice to the entire industry. No one can really understand what the full um, stack of regulations you have to comply with in order to remain uh, on the right side of the law. You can in the United States, but what happens if you want to distribute into different countries, into different jurisdictions? you'll have to fill out the paperwork in that language or in that jurisdiction without fully understanding what that cost is in the long run and may create negative value for the investors as well as the company. And the third layer is conflicted intermediaries and that's what one thing that really caused the financial crisis which were people that broker financial products without understanding or having a deep value add um, proposition for their investors selling products that they didn't really understand. And that still happens today, right? Uh, largely speaking, if we think about the advisory industry, we think about the brokerage industry, we think about brokerage that was happening in the ICO industry, everyone has a conflicted motive to sell that product to the end investor. There are no incentive alignments, and that causes massive friction as well as massive stress on the financial services industry. So the three of these things create Compliance costs, it's such an easy one. Increasing compliance costs, which were intended to support investors, are actually creating a negative backlash. And uh, one of the stats that I was reading up on the, a couple of weeks ago was that trading volume, while it's increased in the US capital markets over the last decade, it's actually creating more and more negative effect on a per dollar basis because of the cost of compliance that the traders or asset management companies are forced to consume in order to sell these products to investors. So that's something that we have to fix and that we think that the blockchain has the ability to fix. So a lot of this we've talked about a lot today, so I won't get into the deep dives. But the paperwork element is something that we're all very, very familiar with. But why is paperwork really that important, right? We have digital means, we went from snail mail to email, we can make a incremental leap forward with digital paperwork, a lot of us use DocuSign. But in actuality, the, the paperwork element goes post facto of the transaction. The reason paperwork is so expensive in the long haul is because of audit costs. It's not necessarily the upfront of preparation of that paperwork, it's the fact that you can't actually audit that paperwork in an efficient fashion in the future. Which means that inevitably, either the issuer or the asset manager or the investor is caught holding the bag. And we were talking about conflicted intermediaries. 
So how can you align investors and asset managers to behave in the best possible way? The best possible way is the incentive alignment that we can create through the blockchain, which is one of the things that a lot of people talk about. You can create a blockchain, but you don't need a token. Okay? You can have a token, but maybe you don't need a blockchain, so you just use it to, find, to raise capital from investors. Okay, I get both arguments. However, if you think about the blockchain as a software that's supposed to exchange value and create an audit trail, it does not align incentives of the participants without the token. You can't use fiat currency to align incentives in the way that you need it to on a real-time basis from a service provider perspective. Fraud and error. Paperwork, we were talking about backdating options and things like that. Preventing fraud is the number one issue that regulators have today. Why are there so many regulations in the market? To protect investors, conspiracy, to protect the incumbents. But in actuality, it's to protect fraud so that you can protect the integrity of the capital markets. You need liquidity. We talked about liquidity until we're blue in the face. Liquidity collapses when there's no trust in the market. So how do you prevent fraud? You can use the blockchain to have a very, very clear audit trail going five, 10, 20 years that you know is immutable. In democratizing access, this is one of our personal passions that we have at Dark Matter, which is private investors, accredited investors, they're the ones that have a lot of access to different financial products, which means inevitably their wealth generation is continuously protected, it grows faster. But if you look at the global markets of billions of people that are underbanked or underserved, they have no access to financial products or portfolio enhancing assets, which means we have to figure out a way to use tokens or blockchain to be able to distribute into this market, which it's able to do. So like I mentioned before, what we've been doing at Dark Matter is building a marketplace platform for the asset management industry to connect efficiently with investors. We want to get rid of as many steps that occur in the process offline and shift it onto our marketplace platform, and we've been doing that for the past four years. So what does the platform actually do right now? What is our centralized platform or software able to accomplish? We provide a direct connection, that's something that doesn't even exist today, to a product that you can actually invest in. Full KYC AML, that software has been around, but how do we decentralize and incentivize people to put their data on the blockchain so that you can access any financial product anywhere in the world? Algorithmic matching, and this isn't the conference for AI or machine learning, but what are the systems that we need to put in place when we have this massive amount of data that exists on the blockchain to make things much more aligned and make things correct and prevent fraud? And I talked about this briefly before. Automated paperwork and cross-border investments are going to be the big themes that we see in talking about blockchain and talking about asset management. And what I mean by that is we talk about STOs, creating a token around a security. While te technologically it may take a lot of work, if you think about the fundamentals of it, it's actually a front end problem. If you understand Reg A plus or Reg D or Reg S or going public, you can create a security token with the right infrastructure. But that infrastructure stops there. That doesn't flow into the asset management companies, it doesn't flow into the custodians, it doesn't flow into your portfolio software. So how can we make that more efficient? And how can we make that a cross-border dialogue versus us just talking about a US uh, regulated paradigm? So over the past four years, we've penetrated over 62 countries for our investor base. We're talking to 150 plus asset managers that are utilizing our platform to distribute their financial products. And why is that significant? That's significant for us because it gives us a first glance. We already have a foot in the door to be able to talk to these asset managers and investors about fixing the backbone. Not the front end, not the token, tokenized asset as of yet, but what is the backbone that they need where the STO market or the tokenized assets or the real estate explodes, how can they absorb that? And absorbing all of that will allow for the primary market, the issuance of all these tokens to occur much more efficiently. 
So some of the things that the, our protocol is working on is the smart subscription documentation, a global KYC function that's stored decentralized so we don't store that information, um, automated reporting. This is something that's super interesting because we talked about financial reporting and audits and how difficult that is today. But what if the tokenized assets or the securities themselves could self-report? What if financial information that flows from one point to another is completely seamless, which is what we envision in the future? Right now, there's a little bit of a disconnect because we talk about financial reporting of a security token, and then we talk about fiat banking. Of course, there's gonna be a huge disconnect there, but what if the value of that token is the currency that we're utilizing? That's what we're talking about today. That means the reporting in and of itself should be automatic. You don't need any third-party administration. Lower access points for investors. If you can comply with the regulations and the disclosures and all the paperwork that occurs, you can distribute to any type of investor anywhere in the world. And that's what the token is um, supposed to be able to do in the near future. Streamlined audit, and I just mentioned this before. All of the compliance costs that occur in asset management are due to audit costs that happen post facto. So what if you knew when you raised that your audit cost would also be lower? It's one of those value prongs we talked about before as to why a fund manager or an asset manager should become a part of this ecosystem and support its growth. And secondary markets, we most of the capital in the world is concentrated in a lot of illiquid assets. We talked about real estate before, but there's a lot more assets than that. What if you can create a secondary market, which is very difficult to create today because of the paperwork involved, in a much more seamless fashion? That means the primary markets are growing at a, at, at a similar pace, if not faster. So the asset management on the blockchain is really talking about the backbone, and that's what I wanted to talk to everyone about today. Not about the security tokens or real estate tokens, but how important it is for us here in the room today to talk about what the backbone is, the infrastructure that is necessary with the incumbents in order for that shift to occur. The last year, over the last 18 months, 24 months, there was a bit of a dichotomy. Oh, cryptocurrency needs to be fully decentralized. We hate Wall Street. Now all we talk about is STOs or security tokens. And really, you need a hybrid or a synergistic effect that occurs because we in this room understand the benefits and the technology, and we are the practitioners that can bring that value to the asset management industry and inevitably make them a part of the ecosystem. We kind of want them to become a part of it without actually knowing that they're becoming a part of something that decentralizes themselves. And the third point here, the direct link between the token and the underlying asset is what's super interesting. We talk about fiat on-ramps, but in theory that's all supposed to disappear. I should take my token that's my real estate asset and be able to shift that into something much more liquid instantaneously, which is what we're building out today. So these are a lot of the functions that we foresee will be built into platforms like Dark Matter and other ones that are building out infrastructure today. Custody, administration, third party distribution, middle back office, all of these cursory functions will actually re be replaced by smart contracts or elements of functions that exist on the blockchain, which allow us to have purely unencumbered global access for any kind of financial asset anywhere in the world. Thank you very much.